Dr. Stephen Matthews is the Denver cardiologist accused of drugging and date raping women. Now we sit down with the attorney representing several of these accusers to understand what happened and the potential for a lawsuit against the dating app company that connected Matthews with these women. Welcome to Sidebar, presented by Law & Crime. I'm Jesse Weber. Dr. Stephen Matthews, we haven't talked about him in a while. He is the 36-year-old Denver cardiologist who has just pled not guilty to charges related to drugging and raping women. Faces 51 felony counts. He's accused of, as, as early as 2019, matching with women on dating apps. And then he would meet them and allegedly slip something into their drinks. They would black out or become disoriented. Many become violently ill. And they wouldn't remember much of what happened. But some women have said that Matthews sexually assaulted them. So he was first arrested in March of 2023 with respect to one woman and then arrested again after more accusers came forward to authorities. And now he is criminally charged with respect to 13 women. He's being held in a $5 million bond and his criminal trial is scheduled to begin March 4th, 2024. This comes after a judge determined that there was Sufficient evidence to move forward with a trial against Matthews. Also, interestingly, Matthews agreed with the Colorado Medical Board to suspend his medical license as his case makes its way through the criminal process. But right now, I want to bring on a very special guest. I'm joined by Stephen Berg. Stephen Berg is an attorney who is representing some of these women in civil court. Stephen Berg, thank you so much for taking the time and coming here on Sidebar. Thank you for having me. So let's first start out, um, who exactly, obviously not identifying, but who do you represent in this case? I, I represent a number of survivors that have uh, been assaulted by Stephen Matthews. And, and in the civil arena, which we're going to get into, not in the criminal arena. Correct. And, you know, we, we basically have put together a group um, of, of survivors that want to see some change here, that want to make sure that something like this can't happen moving forward. Yeah, and I want to get into the potential lawsuits that you might be filing on their behalf. But first, let's just, if you can, can you generally explain, um, because we are seeing a pattern in these allegations, but can you generally explain what their accounts are, what they say happened uh, with them and Matthews? Yeah, um, un unfortunately, the, the, the scenarios seem to be very, very, very similar. Uh, he would build trust. And then um, get them to have a drink, usually close to his home, and um, drug them in that drink. And then they would uh, be very, very impaired and, and uh, not know what's going on. And, and he would sexually assault them. And the, the, they had met him uh, on different apps, and then they would meet at a public place, then go back to his house. I mean, that was seemed to be, again, if he did this, the MO, correct? Correct. Yeah. And, and he was he was very savvy and, and um, able to build trust, say, let's go meet at a public place, uh, talk about his dog, and then oftentimes uh, use that as an excuse to head back to his house or apartment. Did they like him? I mean, obviously, they must have liked him to a certain degree to go on a date with him. But what was happening during the course of those initial conversations where they felt, you know, at least comfortable to go back to his place? Well, look, I mean, he was a... He, He's able to be very charming. He's a he's a cardiologist, um, you know. Seemingly had, um, you know, no red flags for them, and and um, and you know, just trying to find somebody they matched up with, and um, like many people on dating sites, you know, uh, trying to find somebody that that was a good fit. The majority of the clients that you represent. Uh... Do they say that they, they just don't remember anything that happened, um, and then later they would come to find out that they were sexually assaulted? And if so, how did they find that out? Yeah, it, was a, it, it varies from, from individual to individual. Uh, some had flashes of what was going on. Um, oftentimes, you know, it, it, it appeared he would try to blame them for getting too intoxicated or um, try to try to sow some doubt in their minds about their actions or what they did. And did they have, uh, you know, were they administered um, sexual assault exams after some of these cases? 
Uh, some were, and, and some were self-identifying of saying, I don't know what happened. I'm, I'm an experienced drinker. I've never had something like that happen. And they always have these questions. And then when they hear about the stories, um, more and more survivors have come forward and, and said, you know, they, they wanted to put this all behind them, but, but now they want to make sure and stand up and, and provide some change so this doesn't happen moving forward. Any idea what the alleged drug was that was used in these drinks? I, I, I'm not aware of, of, of what that is. Mm -hmm. um, you know, many of, the, many of the drugs clear the system in short amount of time. And um, so I have, have no idea what that would be. How, how, what, um, what allowed them to go forward? Because obviously it seems to me that when one account, came, when there was one woman who came forward, then others seemed to feel comfortable to say what happened to them. Is, is that w the same situation for your clients? Yeah, you know, to take on a, a cardiologist and uh, to stand up and, and, and really have a, uh, a credibility dispute on, on many of the occasions is very, very uh, worrisome for, for many of these survivors of no one will believe me and he'll be able to just ruin me. And so I think it was really powerful having the first survivor come forward and, uh, and, and having everybody see it. You know, quite frankly, every time a story is run about this, there are more and more survivors coming forward saying, oh my gosh, I'm hearing about this for the first time. And I want to do my part to make sure this doesn't happen moving forward. Do you know if they're planning or prepared to testify against Matthews? Yeah, certainly. Um, there are the survivors in, in the first um, indictment, uh, 13, I, I would imagine they're all going to be testifying there, or at least the vast majority of them, and uh, providing their account of, of what happened. And that's never easy because they will be facing. Uh, cross examination, um, which is you, you know by his side, um, and what are your thoughts on that? Because they're going to be faced with some you know tough questions. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, look, you know, uh, many of the survivors are going to have to uh, talk about some of the most personal personal uh, things of their life and in a, in a public setting. And I just got to tell you, I am continually inspired by the strength of these survivors to come forward, to take action, to try to make this a, a better world moving forward. Stephen, I wanted to ask your opinion about this. So Matthew's lawyer uh, said in court that all of these uh, survivors, all of these alleged victims should be named, should be identified so that they're not afforded, quote, a cloak of anonymity. What are your thoughts on that? Well, what he says in, in court, I mean, it, I think if the lawyer believed in it, he should file a motion saying such and, and having the judge rule on it. And, um, you know, it, it just seems to me, my opinion, a little grandstanding. If he, felt, if he feels it's, it's accurate and, and he wants that to happen, then he should file the motion and have the court determine that. But uh, to just talk about it in the media um, is a different avenue to go down, obviously. Have any of your clients uh, given you any indication that they want to come forward publicly, uh, speak about this publicly, or are they waiting for the conclusion of the criminal case? Yeah, you know, I think overall everybody's waiting for the conclusion of the criminal case. We feel like the evidence is going to come out that Stephen Matthews is a, a serial rapist. And uh, once that's concluded and determined, then um, there are several survivors that have said, that at least at this point in time, they do anticipate that they're willing to be able to do that. And I just wanted your reaction as well to, to more of um, what we're hearing from uh, Matthew's camp, who says there's no forensic evidence the women were drugged, uh, there's no proof that these women were uh, helpless, that this is all consensual, um, because those are going to be things that I imagine his team is going to bring up at a criminal trial. What's your response to those kinds of arguments? Yeah, you know, uh, many of the circumstances and... Um, what Matthews was doing was, has not been released to the public. And I think we're going to hear that many, many, many of the survivors' account of what happened is very, very consistent with, with others. And um, it's, it's a lot of evidence that I just don't know how uh, the defense is going to be credibly refuted.
So I, I wanted to switch gears with you because, like I said, you're not representing um, these women with respect to the criminal case against Matthews, although I'm sure um, you're having conversations with them, with them about that. But it's our understanding that after the conclusion of the criminal case, you might be filing a lawsuit or lawsuits on their behalf. Um, can you talk to us about that? Yeah, so we're looking at filing uh, lawsuits uh, against match group number one, and there may be others as we determine other responsible parties, um, and really looking at match groups in in, in their failure. And so match, match group's group the owned, own, is the owner, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. So let me match group owns. They have about eighty percent of the online dating market share, and they own a number of specific apps, including Hinge and, and Tinder. And so, um, you know, one of the one of the failures of match group was when, when Matthews was reported as a rapist, he continued to be on their website for multiple years afterwards. And who reported him as a rapist? One of the, the, your clients, or how was it reported to the company? Um, in writing, reported to Match Group uh, by, by, by a survivor. Before and, the charges, uh, before the criminal charges. Correct. Mm. And what was their response, if any? Uh, I'm really sorry to hear that. He'll be removed. And he wasn't. No. Mm. And he he remained on on their their platforms for multiple years after that. And um, you know, I know that that Match Group made a statement regarding this. And yeah. Um. Let, let me let me read it. Let me read it so everybody sees. So okay. I believe this is the statement you're referring to. This is the statement from Match Group, and it says, "Quote that Match Group is committed." To help keep our community safe and continuously work to improve our systems to help prevent bad act actors from accessing our platform. What's been reported is horrible and has no place on our platform or anywhere. Our teams use a combination of automated tools and human moderation to help remove bad actors proactively. We have fully cooperated with law enforcement and will continue to provide any information to them that would be helpful for their investigation. What do you make of that statement? Yeah, you know, were they keeping the community safe when they they failed to take reasonable action and and allowed somebody who had been reported as a rapist to to continue to utilize their platform and find uh, additional victims for multiple years? Have you seen lawsuits like this filed against dating app companies in the past? Have they been successful? Yeah, you know, the there's. Um, some have been successful, some haven't. Um, when, when they have explicit knowledge of, and somebody's been warning them, a um, majority of those has been successful. Now there is a, a, a 230 immunity for internet platform companies, and, and there's an analysis on whether they're net neutral or not. And, and that's gonna be obviously a fight in, in our case, and, and we're prepared to, uh, to go down that route. If Matthew should be found not guilty at his criminal trial. Would you still bring this lawsuit against the uh, match group? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that there's overwhelmingly, um, th there's going to be an overwhelming amount of evidence that, that shows he is a serial rapist. And, um, you know, given that every time the, the, the media covers this story, um, there's more and more women self identifying and coming forward. And so I anticipate. Uh, there, there likely is a, there's going to be another group of um, victims coming forward, and, and there would be a second group um, of indictments is what I believe would likely take mm. place, even if, even if he um, was somehow found not guilty in the first one. Well, that's so interesting. Um, what would you say would be your biggest challenge uh, of trying to find match group liable in this case? Um, I think the internet platform 230 immunity is yeah. it, of saying that they have, you know, that's, I think that's why they've, they've failed to act on, on so many times is they just rely on that and say, really, we don't have to do anything. I mean, there's a number of, because they can't uh, be held liable for what their users are doing on the platform. Yeah. And, 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 you know, there's a number of prior instances in news reports where, um, rapist has utilize their platform uh, after being convicted as a rapist and mm. even people utilizing their platform uh, from jail, serving a sentence for rape. And that person w 
was not removed. According to these news articles, this is a continued ongoing problem. And it just seems that Match Group uh, has chosen not, not to do anything about it. Other than getting them to change their policies to make sure this doesn't happen, what would you be looking for in terms of damages? You know, uh, the best way to, to change corporate behavior is through a penalty, through compensation, so that next time when somebody reports uh, somebody being a rapist and they say, you know what, I think financially our motive is to do the right thing here and, and, and remove the person so this doesn't be systemic. You know, the second, the second aspect we're looking at is, are there additional protections that can be put in place through uh, state law? Yeah, so we're I, I wanted to ask you about that. My understanding is you, you've spoken with Colorado lawmakers about this? Yeah, so, so we, we've been having ongoing conversations about it and about the need to make significant changes in the law to provide the minimum protections for people using the apps. What kind and of changes? Right, yeah, I mean, right now, the, the, the current legislation talks about, um, you know, removing somebody for fraud. Okay, well, that, that's helpful. Uh, they also talk about not automating, not having an auto renewal um, for, for the, dating, the dating site, charging something on an auto renewal and the process to protect people using it. But it's completely void of anything regarding safety. Mm. And so, you know, at this point in time, we think there needs to be minimal protections put in place that are, that are mandating these uh, dating apps to take action when someone is reported as a uh, as a threat. I guess their response would be, you know, unless there was a, uh, a criminal conviction or even I even suggest maybe a criminal charge is filed, it's one person's word against another. And, you know, someone can make a false accusation against somebody of sexual assault or, or some sort of, uh, you know, harassment. Um, and they re proactively remove them from the, uh, the platform when they shouldn't have been. Yeah. I mean, you look at the potential risk on each side, right? Like, so right. If somebody is is wrongly accused of it, they lose access to a dating site for maybe a few months. Um, but if on the flip side, if they fail to take any action, somebody like um, Matthews, who's been alleged to be a serial rapist, continues to be shown in front of thousands of women and is able to really target his his specific next victim. You know, what's shocking to me as I was looking at this story is that, um, you know, again, look, from a legal point of view, he's innocent until proven guilty. But it doesn't change the fact about these, these allegations. Having said that, if he really did do this and it shows this pattern of behavior, we see it sometimes where someone becomes emboldened, right? You, you would think that, you know, after allegedly committing a crime against one person, they don't get caught. Then they try against the second person. They don't get caught. But it's interesting that it kept going on and never felt that he was going to be reported, never felt that someone was going to come after him. I mean, that I find to be such an interesting aspect of this and also an alarming aspect of this, the number of, uh, you know, uh, alleged victims of, of Mr. Uh, Math of Matthews, of Dr. Matthews, that it's just, that's what's so shocking to me is that this kept going on and it wasn't like there wasn't any hesitation to stop himself from going forward. Yeah, I mean, I, I totally agree. I mean, from what we've seen in the reports, you know, he seemed to be emboldened and, and um, you know, at times he would be having multiple dates on the same night. He would, you know, there oftentimes were women coming out when women were coming in and um, he had a lot of access to a lot of human beings in a short amount of time. And uh, he was very, very, very active on, on the different sites. I mentioned the fact that his license has been suspended. It hasn't been revoked. Uh, his medical license um, could potentially be reinstated at a later date, depending on the outcome of his case. What do you make of that? Yeah, you know, I, I think one of, the, one of the issues in Colorado is we need a little better oversight um, for medical license. You know, after he had been um, arrested on the first charge and uh, was alleged to have drugged and raped an individual, he maintained, as far as we, we're, we're aware, he maintained access and privileges to the hospitals he had and, and able to continue to have one-on-one uh, -on -one access with uh, patients, which obviously is a huge concern uh, for a cardiologist. Uh, by the way, um, your clients, 
other than their own accounts, do they have corroborating evidence that they were attacked by Matthews? Yeah, I mean, many of them have, um, you know, text message, emails, things reaching out to to loved ones right away. Others, um, sane exams, others, um, you know, communications through the app as well. So uh, on an individual, individual basis, many have other collaborating evidence um, or to, to help prove up and justify what they're saying is to be accurate. Did they confront Matthews at any point about this? S- some of them did in a indirect way. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, questions of what happened. Why did this happen? Why don't I remember this? Those type of things. Yeah. And look, you know, I, his team is uh, uh, fighting this, but, um, you know, it's, it's, it's really disturbing to say the least about what we're hearing. And now my understanding is you have called on other potential victims to come forward if they have similar stories. Can you walk us through how uh, that might be going or how you're encouraging other people if they have similar accounts with, Mr., with Dr. Matthews? Yeah, so, so our group has, has come forward, um, obviously, because we want to make sure that something like this doesn't happen again. But in addition, we want others to feel like um, there's a safe space. They can come forward. They can use the example that others have done and shown the strength. And, um, you know, many of the survivors have a certain level of guilt, self-blame, and um, isolation that that they're for this, and so getting the message out and, and getting the you know just people hearing about it has been so inspiring for other survivors to share their stories, and it, it's truly humbling to be to be a part of that process. And look, I'll, I'll tell you, you know, we've covered a number of these types of cases here on Law and Crime, and I think people's understandings of um, sexual assault and the reactions from that and how someone should behave or what they should do or when they should come forward, that's changed. That's changed dramatically. doesn't mean they're not going to face those tough questions during cross-examination or tough questions in, in, in a potential lawsuit, but I think our understanding of what sexual assault uh, victims go through has changed as well. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, everybody's experience is, is individual, um, you know, anywhere from denying that it happened uh, to self blame to then coming through the, the cycles, but you're right. Um, you know, I think the public has learned a lot about sexual assault and how different individuals deal with it differently. And that's really helpful. I think in this environment, Steven Berg, thank you so much for coming on, talking to us a little bit more about this case and maybe what we can expect. Appreciate it. Thanks Jesse. All right, everybody. That's all we have for you right now here on Sidebar. Thank you so much for joining us. Please subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, wherever you get your podcasts. I'm Jesse Weber. Speak to you next time.